Um, we have a, a wonderful program for you. Uh, before I introduce our speaker, there's someone else I'd like to introduce. Um, if you have been immersed in Jim Waller's work, you know that uh, he has combined and used um, the ideas of other important uh, social scientists to create a synthesis with their work. And it is my pleasure and honor to introduce you to John Steiner, Professor John Steiner, Emeritus of Sociology, Sonoma State University, um, whose work appears in, in Jim's book and that Jim has used. And I'd like you all to welcome Dr. Steiner. Thank you for coming. John. Um, our speaker today is James Waller, better known as Jim. Um, he was, has his undergraduate and his graduate degrees from institutions of learning in the state of Kentucky. He currently lives in Spokane, Washington and teaches at Whitworth College. Um, he's been coming here every year for four or five years. Um, and the reason I ask him back is I like him. Uh, he didn't bring his wife this time. We usually have a lot of fun chatting, but also because students like you rate his lecture as one of the best that they've had a chance to see. So I'd like you to welcome uh, Jim Waller, who's going to speak about Becoming Evil. Thank you. Uh, can you hear me OK if I'm just out here? you see on the slides, if you'd like to uh, have a copy of or see more closely, I can certainly send that to Dr. Goodman. So I want to start by saying thank you to Myrna for extending the invitation yet again. I keep thinking I'm aware of my welcome here, which would be disappointing because it's one of the favorite things I do every year. Uh, you don't know it. Sometimes I think when you're at an institution and you get a class like this, an opportunity like this, you tend to think all schools have this opportunity. But trust me, because I do a lot of these lectures, around the country each year, there are very, very, very few schools that have a class as innovative and a program as innovative as this, dating all the way back to Dr. Steiner, now continuing to Dr. Goodman. So you really do have a unique opportunity here. And myself aside, she brings in some incredible speakers, okay? Every year uh, when she does this, so it really is very fortunate for you to have this opportunity. It's fortunate for me to be here today as Myrna said, I live in Spokane, Washington. Starting on December 23rd and ending on January 2nd, we got 70 inches of snow, 7-0. Most of it's still on the ground. I haven't seen green grass in forever. So flying in here today, and even though it's wet and soggy and damp, this just looks beautiful to me. It's warmed my heart to actually see grass. And it's also great to be here because my son, I have three children, uh, my youngest son, Noah, is a fifth grader. And he started beginning band lessons. He plays a trumpet about four weeks ago. And he practices a lot at home. So I'm thrilled to be here. It's <laughs> <laughs> a great opportunity for me. Uh, let me tell you a little bit about my background and what I do and, and how I do it and what we'll be talking about here over the next hour or so together. Uh, I am by training a social psychologist. This is my 24th year in the field of social psychology. I'm actually taking a leave from my teaching assignment, and I'm working now as an affiliated scholar with the Auschwitz Institute for Peace and Reconciliation. So what that means is, three times a year, I go to Auschwitz, and at Auschwitz, we bring, the Institute brings, 20 junior level government officials from around the world for a week-long seminar on genocide. What genocide is, what the warning signs are, and most importantly, as a government official, what you can do to stop genocide once you see it occurring. So our first class that we had last May had government officials from Latin America, from Europe, from the United States, from the Middle East, just a wide range of people. And so most of my time now is spent in developing curriculum for those seminars and teaching those seminars. And you can kind of imagine, you know enough now about the Holocaust to imagine the power of being able to 
would teach about genocide and the Holocaust literally on the grounds of Auschwitz in a dormitory, in a barrack of Auschwitz I, and you kind of sense the power that it has for government officials. So I've been enjoying that time. But my training as a social psychologist is in a field that talks about how the presence of other people influences how we think, how we feel, and how we behave. Most people who work in social psychology would study what we typically call normal human relations. How people develop friendships, how people fall in love, how people tend to work together in groups, and how they can work better in groups. For whatever reason, in my nearly quarter of a century in the field, I've been more drawn to what happens when people don't relate well to each other, the cases of human misrelations. So my first couple of books were on race relations in America. That's still a significant interest to me. But over the past 15 years or so, my focus has really gone toward that extreme end of what happens when people misrelate to each other in cases of genocide, uh, mass killing, atrocities, human rights abuses. And in that, I've been drawn specifically to the context of perpetrator behavior. And we'll define what perpetrator behavior is and what I mean by perpetrators in a few moments. But really, the two very broad things I want to do with you today is, one, situate the discussion of perpetrators of genocide in the context of genocide and how it fits really in our understanding of human conflict and human interaction. So I want to start with the broadest possible scope and then work our way down to understanding who are the men and women, by and large men, but some women, who are the men and women at the front lines of killing in cases of genocide and mass violence, and how do they do the things that they do? So let's start at the beginning, which is to look very broadly at social conflict in human history. Many of you will recognize this lithograph to the left-hand side. Uh, this comes from Jewish Christian tradition. Uh, obviously, Jewish Christian tradition is not the only tradition that's informed the Western world, but the Jewish Christian tradition has certainly informed a large part of how the Western world thinks about itself. And in this story from the Hebrew Scriptures, the two sons of Adam and Eve, Cain and Abel, make a sacrifice to Yahweh. For whatever reason, and the scriptures are unclear on the reason, Yahweh looks with favor upon Abel's sacrifice and with disfavor upon Cain's sacrifice. And then the scriptures go on to say, the story goes on to say, that at some point in the future, Cain falls upon his brother Abel in the field and kills him. Now most of you, or many of you probably know this story. You've heard it. For some of you, it's a true story about human origins. Some of, you, some of you would see it as mythological, just part of religious tradition and sex. But regardless of how you think about it, it has to really shape a lot of how we think about human relationships. And one of the things you note about the story is that this is the first time death comes into the world. Two men, says Ada Gazelle, and one of them becomes a killer. Now, I understand that could come into the world any number of ways. The first time death made its appearance, it could have come in by, by famine, by pestilence, by plague, by heart attack, by accident, the most common form of death. But the first time death comes into the world in this tradition, it comes in the form of murder. Two men, one of them becomes <coughs> killed. And again, why do you understand the story to be literally true or just a, a mythological one? Being it does kind of set us off in this discussion of the role of human misrelationships in human history. So if we look at some of the data about social conflict in human history, we'll see that since the Napoleonic Wars, we fought an average of six international wars and six civil wars per decade. Since 1900, at any time since 1900, we've had an average of three high fatality struggles going on. High fatality means loss of life of more than 1,000 victims. So pick any year since 1900, any month of the, any day of that month, any hour of that day, any minute of that hour, any second of that minute, and you've got an average of three high fatality struggles going on somewhere in the world at that given moment. Since the end of World War II, 150 wars, only 26 days of world peace. Today, actually, more than a third of the world's 193 nations are embroiled in conflict, including our country which, as you know, is involved in two conflicts. 
There are two quotes I remember or think about when I see this slide. One comes from Winston Churchill. Churchill once said, the story of the human race is war. And if you think about that, Dr. Goodman gave you an assignment and said by the end of the semester, and she'd never do this, by the end of the semester, you have your paper, has to be like a 400 page paper on the story of the human race. But you could only tell that story from one perspective. What perspective, what lens would give you the most complete story to help us understand how our nation states are organized, to help us understand distribution of language, to help us understand distribution of disease, to help us understand how we came to be, what lens would you choose to tell that story? I think you'd be hard pressed to find a more accurate lens than the lens of war. I mean, war has to understand. It's such a, a consistent part of human history. War helps us understand how we've come to be the way we are today. It doesn't make it right, but its consistency throughout the human experience makes it a vitally important topic of study. The other quote I think of when I see this comes from an ancient Greek philosopher, Plato. Plato once said, only the dead have seen the end of war. And what does he mean by that? There's going to be no end of war. The only people that are going to see the end of war will be people who die. Because they're not going to see anything after that, right? But if you're alive in human history, you've been alive when war's been in the world. In your life, you're going to be alive, all the days of your life, when war is a present part of the human condition. We hope that in your lifetime, our country will be out of the two wars it's in. But even if we are, War is still going to be a major shaper in world affairs. And the number of people who have died because of war is also very significant. Here you see the data that in the 20th century, five times the number of deaths from war compared to the 19th century, 10 times the number of deaths from the 18th century. Sometimes people see a slide like this, and you tend to think, that's all technology. Um, we've just gotten better at killing each other in greater numbers, and part of that is true. But we can actually <coughs> partition out the effects of technology from a data set like this, and we can see that we still see the same steep trajectory, because the number of armed conflicts has just continued to increase over the centuries. We've actually topped out or leveled off in the past decade, but there's reason to suspect that that's gonna pick up again probably, as population growth continues to expand, we have scarcity of resources. So the point is that you know, we have gotten more proficient at something we shouldn't be proficient at, and that's killing each other in the context of war. Now, I'm not by interest. Yeah? Hey, well, you were saying, because I mean, couldn't that, that steep be attributed to like, population growth, yeah. or just more people in general? Yeah, both of those. That's a good point. The two things that you could look at here, one I mentioned was technology. One I didn't mention that's an outstanding point is population growth. If you wanted to kill six million Jews, or six million of any people in the 1500s, you couldn't travel far enough to get your hands on six million people. By the 1940s in Europe, population had expanded to the point that to kill six million people was relatively easy from the context of literally being able to get your hands on them. So part of this increase in war-related deaths is certainly technology, is certainly population growth. But again, you can partition out the effects of those two things, and you still see the same type of steep upward trajectory. Now again, my interest is not in war, per se. My interest is when that line, and it's a very gray area, between acceptable military conduct when soldiers are fighting against other soldiers and killing other soldiers. And some of you say that's not acceptable, but at least it's not criminal conduct. When the line between that and another event is crossed, and the other event <coughs> is when civilians are falling prey to soldiers, military, or paramilitary forces. When we've crossed that line, I think we moved into the realm of genocide. Now you're gonna probably in this class get a ton of different exposures and definitions to what genocide is, from the UN definition to a wide range of scholarly definitions. 
But I have a friend uh, who was one who was actually the last American to stay in Rwanda, who now lives in Spokane, and he captures it this way, and I like this. He says, genocide happens when a group in power decides another group of people no longer matters to them. And when a group in power decides that you no longer matter, and it's just not just the issue of indifference, okay? But you no longer matter to such a degree that I actually want to take the effort to exterminate you. Now we cross the line into genocide. Raul Hilbert, a famous Holocaust historian, late Holocaust historian, who said it this way: that a lot of times governments or groups in power come to power and they say there's another group of people living in our community that we no longer wish to live among us, and we force them out of our country or we isolate them in ghettos. <coughs> but in genocide. You take off the final part of that statement, and it becomes there's another group of people living in our community that we no longer wish to live, period. And when a regime or a group in power makes that decision, they have crossed this line into genocidal behavior. behavior. Okay? Genocide, unfortunately, is not a recent invention, invention but we have become relatively adept at genocide recently in such a way that many scholars have referred to the 20th century as the age of genocide. So on this slide, you will see many cases of genocide that you read about and maybe studied in this course, beginning with the destruction of a native Southwest African population of Guerreros in 1904, continuing with the murder of a million and a half Armenians by Turks between 1915 and 1923, that genocide is important for us to remember because Turkey still denies it as a matter of official government policy. So April 24th of every year, and I'm sure there's commemoration in this area as well, the Armenian community worldwide comes together to remember this genocide. And they need to, because a large part of the world is intent on arguing that this genocide never occurred. Uh, I'm the program chair this year for the International Association of Genocide Scholars. It's a professional conference that in June is meeting at George Mason in Virginia. So as program chair, anyone who wants to be on the program sends a proposal to me and other members of the committee, and we review their proposal to accept or, or reject their proposal for presentation. Uh, we received four days ago a proposal from a scholar in Turkey who wants to present a paper denying the Armenian genocide. He doesn't say it outright, but as you read the text of what he's written, every time he uses genocide after the word Armenian, he puts it in quotes, and he talks about the genocide problem. And it's easy to track him back through his university and realize that he's part of a very active group of deniers of the Armenian genocide. So the commemoration of that genocide is particularly important. The implementation of Soviet man-made famine in Ukraine between 32 and 33, uh, Ukrainian farmers did not buy into Stalin's collective system of agriculture, so he implemented a famine. Nature didn't do it, he did it. Cut off water supplies, burned crops to the fields, cut off supplies and resources to people in Ukraine, and it's estimated that 10 million Ukrainians died in a two-year period because of a famine made by Stalin, not made by nature. In November of 2006, the Ukrainian parliament, for the first time in its history, declared these events genocide. Now, they couldn't really say much about it before because they were part of the former Soviet Union. But now that they had freedom and they had the power, they, named, they called these events by their proper name, that this was genocide. The Holocaust of 1939-45, you hear from Holocaust survivors uh, in this program, you know that two out of every three of Europe's Jews died in, in that particular genocidal episode. Mass killings and genocide in Indonesia, Bangladesh, Burundi, Cambodia, East Timor, Guatemala, Iraq, Rwanda, and Bosnia and Herzegovina. The final two here, Rwanda and Bosnia and Herzegovina, are particularly important to me because this is where a large amount of my data comes from. A large part of what I worked with when I wrote Becoming Evil was Holocaust testimony. Uh, archival testimony of perpetrators who were put on trial, uh, testimony from survivors and bystanders and witnesses about perpetrator behavior. Large part of what I continue to do is interview face-to-face -face 
alleged and convicted perpetrators in Rwanda. So I'm typically in Rwanda once or twice a year, interviewing people who have been accused of genocide, are convicted of genocide, some of which have actually, believe it or not, already served their time in the Rwandan system, and they're now outside of the system. And also spending time in Bosnia and Herzegovina, interviewing alleged and convicted perpetrators there. You may not be able to see these pictures real well, but these pictures actually come from the last time I was in Bosnia and Herzegovina. I was there also as part of the International Commission on Missing Persons. And one of the things that ICMP does, it works in Colombia, Iraq, and Bosnia, is it tries to find missing persons who have gone missing because of human rights violations, or in this case, because of genocidal massacre at Srebrenica. And it tries to reunite the remains of those victims, those missing persons, with their living relatives. So these slides actually come from about 200 slides I took when I was part of ICMP that summer, where we exhumed the mass grave of Muslim men and boys, some of the 8,000 Muslim men and boys who were slaughtered in Srebrenica in July of 1995. This grave was found in June of 2007 by two boys playing soccer in a muddy field. One of them goes, goes to kick the ball, he kicks out the divot, and with it comes up a bone fragment. Uh, authorities are called in. You don't know if it's a horse or a cow that's been buried by a farmer, but as the digging commences, what you find out is that this is a mass grave. And this was a secondary mass grave, which means these Muslim men and boys have been killed elsewhere, have been buried elsewhere, but at the end of the war have been dug up by Bosnian Serbs with bulldozers, and their remains just shipped off in trucks to be buried elsewhere. So what we found in this trip grave were body parts belonging to about 50 victims of the Srebrenica genocide. No full skeleton just random body parts that <coughs> over time we hope will be identified so the remains can be given back to the family and the family can give a proper burial for their father, grandfather, uncle, son, brother in the Muslim tradition, which many families haven't yet been able to do 12 years after the fact of the genocide in Srebrenica. So if we total all the victims here that we see on this slide in the 20th century, the total number of victims of genocide would be about 60 million. 60 million. And I know that, you know, sometimes when you work in a field, you tend to think that your field is the most important thing going. And you may feel that about your major in some ways. And I don't want to fall prey to that temptation. But again, if you ask me, of all the problems in the 20th century <coughs> facing humankind, what are the most significant problems? It's hard to come up with something that takes more than 60 million lives. When a state kills 60 million people of its own citizens, you're hard pressed to really think of many more significant human problems. If we take, for instance, <coughs> excuse me, anti-state terrorism, the type of terrorism we saw 9-11, where a group not in power tries to inflict terror on the citizenry. In the 20th century, anti-state terrorism took about 500,000 lives. And I don't mean to minimize. That's half a million people who died because of events like 9-11 in the 20th century. 500,000 people who loved someone, were loved by someone else, who had hopes, dreams, and aspirations that would never be fulfilled. So I don't want to minimize it. But if you have to compare 500,000 victims of anti-state terrorism to 60 million victims of state-sponsored genocide terrorism, you start to see why the many people in the world, the human rights world, are very concerned about issues of genocide regime. Unfortunately, uh, genocide does not remain a 20th century problem, as you will discuss in this class, and you know already to some degree, we still struggle with genocide here in the 21st century. There are several hot spots around the world for genocide. That's the subject of another lecture. But two of those that we've been concerned about for a long period of time are Chechnya and Sudan. As most of you know, the area of the world right now in which genocide is ongoing is Darfur, which is the western region of Sudan. This is a genocide that's now over six years old. And this genocide has lasted longer than most wars. 
in which we've been involved. Uh, it's a genocide about which we have a great amount of information. It's a genocide about which we've had a lot of activism. You may have a campus chapter stand. Students, students taking action now about their four. If you don't, you can certainly start one. Genocide Intervention Network would be glad to help you do that. So we know a lot about this genocide. We're trying to get the political will to stop it, but it's going in its seventh year now, <coughs> since February 2003. And there's no sign that it's going to stop anytime soon. So all the reasons that we had, if we look back at, at the previous slide, for why we didn't stop genocide, those reasons are still plaguing us today, even as we sat here and we think about our course. So as you go through this program and this course, understand that much of what you're reading is history, and understanding this history is being repeated. As we sat here today, people are losing lives because of the same mechanics that you've read about in Rwanda, and Cambodia, and Bosnia and Herzegovina, and the Holocaust. So my interest in this, then, is with as I said, perpetrators. And when I say that I'm interested in perpetrators, um, there are a couple of ways you could hear that that aren't as relevant for what I want you to hear. One way you could hear it when you think of perpetrators is to think of the architects of genocide. The men, and it's pretty often, most often men, who make decisions about genocidal policies. Architects are important to genocide, and genocide doesn't happen without them. But very few architects of genocide actually carry out the killing. <coughs> they set the policy, but other people do the work. And we focus a ton of attention on architects of genocide. So I wasn't interested in that being my focus. The other level of perpetrator are mid-level bureaucrats. The people like in the Holocaust and Adolf Eichmann, who made sure that the trains kept running on time and ran at full capacity as they went to one of the six death camps in the East, so that with the greatest efficiency and greatest productivity, Jews could die. Eichmann again, and mid-level bureaucrats like him, are a significant part of the bureaucracy <coughs> construction. But Eichmann himself doesn't kill anyone, hands on. Now does this make Hitler and Eichmann any less responsible morally? Of course not. But it pushes us to ask the hard question, many, which is, who are the people that actually carry out the killing? I mean, in genocide, we talk about these numbers of victims, 60 million, <coughs> and we don't stop to think and ask the question, how many people does it take to kill? 60 million people. And usually when I ask my classes or groups that question, they'll start with, well, you have Hitler and you have that, that. Well, no, not architects, not mid-level bureaucrats, the people at the front lines who actually pull the trigger, who swing the machete, who swing the masseau, the club studded with nails, the people like this man here on the edge of a pit, this is from an ISOPS group in action uh, in Eastern Europe in 41 and 42, and he is about, as you can see, to execute a man who's gonna fall into a pit that's already pretty well filled with bodies of other victims. What you also can't see well here is in the top left-hand corner a woman who has come as a bystander to this particular execution, and the best guess of scholars is actually she's there selling baked products uh, as people come to watch this event, similar to what we saw with lynchings in the American South, lynchings of blacks. This man at the edge of the pit, who's about to pull the trigger, is the man that historically we've known the least about. I mean, there have been people like Dr. Steiner and others who over time have tried to understand the men and the occasional women at the front lines of the genocide process, but more often than not, we've studied the broad mechanics of mass murder, how it worked bureaucratically, rather than paying attention to the people at the front lines who actually carry out the killing. And it strikes me, and this is kind of the foundation for this general principle, <coughs> that if you're a genocidal regime, okay, your group rises to power, and you decide you want to commit genocide, there are a lot of things you have to worry about. You have to worry about resistance from the victims. Okay? We used to think that Jews in the Holocaust didn't resist. 30 years ago, that was many people's thought. We've had decades of research showing very active resistance on the part of Jews. So you have to worry about resistance from the victims. 
You have to worry about resistance <coughs> from other people in your country who might say, I don't care what you think of a victim group, you can't kill them. You may have to worry about resistance from the international community, although between you and I, if you want to commit genocide, you can do what you want to do before the UN is going to intervene, before the world's going to decide to stop. And we've seen that time and time again since 1946. But here's the one thing you don't have to worry about. You don't have to stay up late at night wondering, where am I going to get the killers? Who's going to do it? Who's going to pull the trigger? Who's going to swing the machete? Who's going to put the pellets in the gas chamber? Genocidal regimes don't have to worry about that. That's not a world that I'm thrilled about living in. I want to live in a world where a genocidal regime comes to power and they want to commit genocide, and at some point they have to throw their hands up and say, as much as we'd love to kill this group of people, we just can't find the people to do the killing. It doesn't happen that way. When a genocidal regime decides they want to kill, the one thing they don't have to worry about is finding the killers. To me, this is a crucial understanding of how genocide comes about and how we can stop it. We have to understand why it's so relatively easy to find people to carry out the mechanics of killing. So these are the two research questions that uh, drive my work. One is, how many people does it take to carry out genocide mass killing? Again, this is a question when I ask my classes, how many Jews died in the Holocaust? As a matter of cultural literacy, they know it was roughly six million. Okay? And that's just part of what we pick up living in American culture, a matter of general cultural lit literacy. But when you ask the corresponding question, how many people does it take to kill six million people in roughly a six year period? That's something we very seldom think about. And obviously, you're not going to get precise numbers here. But the estimates, to give you an idea, of the killers in the Holocaust, like the ones on the edge of this pit, run as high as 500,000. Men, occasionally <coughs> women, who actually bloody their hands with the hard work of killing at the front lines of genocide. Rwanda is another case. Uh, in Rwanda, 800,000 victims in a 100-day period beginning in April 1994. You can take any 100-day period of the Holocaust, and you won't find a rate of killing like that. That was a frenzy of killing in 100 days, 800,000 victims. Very little ammunition, almost all machete, almost all masseur. The clubs with nails driven through them, so they protrude on one side. You can actually trace the roughly the numbers of killings day by day in Rwanda over this 100-day period. And what you tend to see is something fairly cyclical. But the first time I visited Rwanda, I thought maybe it had something to do with the weather. But on a day like today, you just don't go out and kill people because it's too hard, it's too taxing. The weather's too horrendous. But people in Rwanda will say, no, the killing was so hard to do. Clubbing, hacking a person to death, that after a while, the groups that did the killing would actually just take time off. And they drink man beer and they rest up because killing was such hard work. So how many, how many perpetrators do we think there were in Rwanda? The first time I visited, I had a colleague tell me he thought the number of perpetrators who actually killed would be as high as one million. Now I already knew we had about 800,000 victims. How would you have one million perpetrators? And his response was, because the perpetrators did a lot of their killing in groups, groups of 10 or 15 young boys in the Terra Hanway would gang up on one or two victims and kill them. Now, over time, our estimates of perpetrators in Rwanda become a bit more realistic, and we guess about 250,000 Rwandans, mostly Hutu extremists, literally bloodying their hands with the hard work of killing them. And again, to give you some idea, and these are all the things that you'll touch on in this program, in, now after the Holocaust, by and large, Jews fled to the former Nazi Germany, Nazi occupied territories. They relocated to the States, they relocated to, Israel, uh, to Canada, they relocated in large numbers to Israel. 
very few Jews chose to remain and learn to have to learn to live side by side with the people who tried to wipe them out. And understandably so. In Rwanda, the victims, the Tutsis, from 1994, don't have that option. They have no country to relocate to other than their own. They don't have the skills and language abilities to immigrate in large numbers elsewhere, although many of them have found their way to America and other places. But most of them have to stay in Rwanda, learn to live sometimes literally next door, shoulder to shoulder, with a Hutu family who at the least probably stole from them in the genocide a radio or cattle, and at the most may have tried to kill them in the genocide. So you start to see the, the repercussions that genocide has. It's not just those 100 days in 1994. Today, Rwanda is still convulsing from that genocide. In Trapanitsa, I told you 8,000 Muslim men and boys killed in 1995. The number of Bosnian Serbs at that genocidal massacre in Trapanitsa around as high as 20 to 25,000. So however we cut it, the very simple answer to this question, how many people does it take, is an awful lot. I mean, it takes a, a lot of people to carry out genocide. We're not talking about a simple um, atrocity or beating or some isolated incident. We're talking about an awful lot of people that have to be involved with the front lines. And so then the second question is, <coughs> who are these people? Where do they come from? How are they recruited to do this killing? And to me, this is the main question. It's kind of, again, correlated to the first one. The first one is, we've got a lot of people we have to explain here who have become genocide killers. Now comes the hard part of explanation. Where do they come from? Are, are these people hiding? I don't know what your rivals are, but in eastern Washington, we would say, these people must be from Idaho. You know, that's where they have to come from. Because only strange people would do something like this. There aren't enough people in Idaho to account for this, right? It's a genocide in the 20th century. Has to be people from elsewhere. But it's a question that we're going to kind of be pushed to try and address here over the next few minutes. I'm obviously not the first person to try and answer this question. People before me, and if you read Become the Evil, this is kind of part one of the book. People before me have tried to understand this, but I don't think they've tried to understand it in what seems to me a little bit uh, dissatisfying way. And that is that some people have tried to say, and this makes sense maybe a little, that genocidal killers are extraordinary, right? <coughs> this is very unusual. That is extraordinary behavior, not in a good way, but a bad way. And our thought is, anyone who behaves in an extraordinary fashion, there must be an extraordinary explanation for it. So for a long time, when people sought to understand who are the genocidal killers, they looked for very extraordinary and usual explanations. And I've listed a few of these here. One is the extraordinary nature of the collective sociologists like Gustavo Bohm, a theologian like Reinhold Niebuhr, pop psychologists like M. Scott Peck who would say, anytime a group of people come together, bad things happen. Okay? Uh, some of you may this past weekend were in groups of people and some bad things happened. I have a couple of teenagers, they have sleepovers. Bad things happen when groups of them get together. That's not surprising. But as an explanation for genocidal killers to say that when groups of people come together, bad things just automatically happen, so we've got to keep groups of people away from each other, just keep them separate and isolated, that's just not an adequate social scientific or philosophical or literary explanation of any time. I think, secondly, some people have pointed to the notion of an extraordinary ideology, that it's a belief system that drives genocidal killers. And again, I, I don't ever mean to say ideology or a belief system plays no role. But we have to understand the role it plays. And for you to say, or for someone like Daniel Jonah Goldhagen to say, it's only ideology that drives genocidal killers, I think is incredibly misleading. Again, I've interviewed enough perpetrators in Bosnia and Rwanda to know that most of them couldn't tell you what the ideology was that was driving their behavior. I mean, in Rwanda, again, the most common response perpetrators give to why did you do what you did? Why did you kill? 
was they had a radio I wanted. They had a cow I wanted. I wanted a chance to have their house. I thought they were going to kill me. I mean, these aren't deep ideological beliefs. This is greed. This is opportunism. These are land grabs in Bosnia and Herzegovina. So I think we have to be careful about saying it's all ideology. Ideology is a piece of it. But I think more often than not, ideology is the justification that comes after the killing. In other words, sometimes when people think about ideology, they think you believe this list of things, and then you kill. But I think more often, you kill. And then, you believe this list of things because that justifies your killing. You see the difference there? It's not the beliefs that cause the behavior. It's the beliefs that justify what you did. And to me, that's the more interesting role that ideology plays. And then finally, many people have said it's kind of the nature of extraordinary individuals that the perpetrators of genocide have to be uh, either what I've called mad Nazis or bad Nazis. They have to be pathological. They have to be disturbed. They have to have a twisted personality of some type. And I go into a lot of detail on this in the book, and I think Jack before I forget. I probably should read it again. But somewhere in the <laughs> first part of the book, I talk in detail about the limitations of the mad Nazi and bad Nazi thesis. It just, it may explain some perpetrators, but it doesn't explain the greatest number perpetrators. As a matter of fact, you could argue if the general population, which I think is roughly true, the general population in this room, about 10% of us, statistically, are likely to suffer from some emotional or mental uh, disorder of some type, some type of pathology, however loosely defined. So you would say if about 10% of the general population suffers from it, you might expect that 10% of the perpetrator population who suffer from some form of pathology. But actually, especially when you see this in Nazi Germany, perpetrators and who was recruited for that were kind of weeded out in such a way that you could argue that less than 10% of perpetrator populations probably had some form or some level of pathology. So this leads us to what is uh, the central thesis of what I work from which is that it's ordinary people like you and me who commit genocide mass killing. Again, uh, this is, it's not an original argument. People before me have made this argument. Um, it is, though, a very difficult argument to admit, to understand, to absorb. Like, again, you just don't want to live in a world where you have to recognize that the perpetrators of genocide share some very important fundamental characteristics with the people that sit next to you and indeed with you yourself. That there are people you know who could, under certain circumstances, be involved in the front lines of genocidal murder or mass killing. And it's interesting to me, you know, when I talk with groups and we talk about perpetrators as those Hutu extremists in Rwanda, the Nazi Germans, uh, Germans in the Holocaust, the Bosnian Serbs in Bosnia and Herzegovina, people are fine with that and they want to have that discussion. But when you start bringing it closer to home and say, could anything like this ever happen in our country? Do you know people who could do this? That's uncomfortable. When you start to ask questions of yourself, could I ever do anything like this? That's exceptionally uncomfortable. Those aren't the types of questions we want to ask. So I understand this is a difficult argument. When I left last night, Spokane, when I left this morning, but last night when I put kids to bed, kind of tucked them in, I'd love to do that and really fully believe that they will never meet or know anyone who's capable of doing what we're talking about here today, even though we live close to Idaho. I want to believe that they'll never meet or know anyone like that. But it's difficult, though, to face the reality they know a lot of people like this. And your prayer for them then becomes, I just don't hope you don't have to live through it. I hope you don't live through a time of genocide. I hope our democracy functions well enough that we don't see the reality of how many people we know who could commit these types of atrocities. 
T.H. Huxley, some of you may recognize the name. He was a friend of Charles Darwin. Uh, he was called Darwin's Bulldog because Charles Darwin was very, I'll just read in your campus newspaper about a faculty member you have here who was uh, off in Galapagos Islands teaching about Darwin's past February. Totally cool. But Darwin was very shy about his beliefs in evolution. For the personal reasons, some family reasons, some marriage reasons, he didn't like to talk about it a lot. He understood it deeply, but didn't like to talk about it. T.H. Huxley was a friend of his who was the exact opposite. Huxley didn't know it well at all, but he had no problem talking about it anytime, anywhere, any person. And this is what Huxley once said, my business is to teach my aspirations to conform themselves to fact, not to try and make facts harmonize with my aspirations. And this is our challenge today. Which of these two things are we going to do? Are we going to hold on to our belief, our aspirations, our hope of how the world works and try to make facts fit that somehow? Are we going to take the facts of how the world works and try to help those inform our aspirations about the world? And I'm asking you today to come to grips with a very unsettling fact about you and the people around you, the potential within you to become a genocidal killer even though it's, it's very unlikely to ever happen, the potential that is there within each of us to do this, not to excuse it, not to make it right, but just to try to understand it. You're becoming an educated person. One of the things you, you kind of pledge to, you haven't signed off on this, but it's there, trust me, is when you become an educated person, you said, I hold truth in esteem. I value truth. That's part of becoming an educated, is finding those truths. But it doesn't mean that every truth you find is going to be a great one, and it's going to make you feel good about yourself and make you feel good about the world you live in. When you hold truth in the scene, you're going to come across some truths that are just uncomfortable, that don't make you look good, that don't make people in your life look good, that don't make this world a safe place. That doesn't make it any less true. It just makes it miserable, right? This is, I think, the idea that ordinary people like you and me commit genocide mass killing, this is one of those miserable truths of human existence that I think if we come to grips with, we stand a much better chance of trying to cut it off. And again, what's frustrating is when people work in genocide prevention as if genocidal killers are hard to find. None of us can do it. They're very pathological. They're very unusual. That's not real helpful when you're trying to prevent something you don't understand. <coughs> I think this understanding to me offers us the best hope of trying to prevent genocide in the future because if we know how perpetrators are made, we can know how to stop them from being made. We can know how to unmake them. But if we just keep our eyes closed and just wish that perpetrators are very unusual and don't try to understand them, we have no hope of stopping them. Because if we'd never do that with a disease, right? Not now. I mean, if there's some plague that hits no mistake, you wouldn't just bury your head in the sand and go, oh, I just hope it goes away, hope it goes away, it shouldn't happen to us. You would hope there'd be people in the medical field trying to figure out the cause of the disease so they can stop its spread, right? And that's what I think we're trying to do here. Let's figure out the cause. Why is it that people can relatively easily become genocidal killers and then let's try to figure out how to stop it from that understanding. So that's what I've tried to offer. And I think you have this, came in on a handout today, is this right? So um, this is kind of a silly model that I've developed to try and understand this and explain it to some degree. You're not going to go into a lot of detail about the model because you can read more about it in the uh, second part of the book. But let me just real briefly tell you that what I've tried to do here is to understand all of the forces that are at play in transforming a quote-unquote ordinary person into someone capable of committing genocide and mass killing. Okay? The case study I used to start the book was from an officer at Mauthausen by the name of Zarax. Any number of case studies you could use. Let me use another one just for, uh, just because it's different and new. Uh, one of the guards in Auschwitz who was eventually put on trial after the 
genocide in World War over, found guilty and put to death for his egregious behavior. Uh, I'm going to spare you the details of what this guard did at Auschwitz. But those details of what he did would uh, exemplify the grossest abuses and violations of human dignity and human life that you can imagine in the Holocaust. That's this man in 1945. Let's go back about 10 years to 1935, that same man, okay, who's going to commit these terrible abuses in Auschwitz, so terrible he's put to death for it. 1935, that same man's a school teacher, the equivalent of elementary school, in a small town in southern Bavaria in Germany. Uh, he is the father of the year in his community. He's a dedicated member of the Roman Catholic Church. He's a wonderful husband. He's a wonderful son. He's a wonderful brother. Uh, the Nazis come to power. They require how Hitler salutes early on in some provinces from teachers at the beginning of the class. This man doesn't do it. He's not part of the Nazi party. He doesn't seem to be terribly anti-Semitic, any more so than any of his neighbors. A child in his class goes to his parents, the child's parents, and tells the parents that my teacher is not starting class with a salute. The parents go to the equivalent principal of the school. The principal calls the teacher in and says, if you don't start class with a salute, we're going to have to let you go. To keep his job, the man begins class and kind of a half-hearted object for salutes. How does this man become this man in Auschwitz in 1945? What is that process of transformation? Now see, isn't the story so much easier if I tell you about this brutal death camp guard in Auschwitz, and we can fill in the blanks and say he was brutal his whole life. He tortured animals, he was a bully, he was mean to other kids, he spit on Jews every time he saw them. All of that makes sense, that's easy. But when I tell you what is much more the common story of a relatively ordinary even you could say good and decent man who becomes this vile monster here. How does that happen? What's that process? And for all the, the intimidating way the model looks, I mean, that's all I'm trying to understand with it. What are the forces that move this man here to becoming this beast here? And again, if we can understand those, I think we have some hope for stopping it. So I try to put it in three, three broad frames. One is the cultural construction of worldview. In other words, what is the culture like in which this perpetrator is raised? It's not that you have a society of perpetrators, but there are cultural characteristics that leave you with a society capable of producing perpetrators. Three of those I pointed out are collectivistic values, authority orientation and social dominance. For instance, and this is true in Belgium, it's true in Germany, certainly true in Cambodia, uh, and Rwanda, and Bosnia and Herzegovina. The cultural model was one of authority and social dominance. If you had authority because you were male, because you were a father, because you were in a position of power, that authority was not going to be questioned. I mean, just what, it's not part of the cultural ethos. Does this mean that in any culture that rests on authority, orientation, and social dominance, you're going to have genocide? No. But it means when you're a regime and you come to power in a culture like that, you have a ready card to play to get people involved in genocide. They will be prepared to obey because you're an authority, even if you're an illegitimate authority to some degree. So when we can't understand why well, two extremists are running the streets, hacking people to death in Kigali, the capital city of Rwanda, simply because the radio tells them to do it? We can't understand it because we haven't grown up in that type of cultural situation. It doesn't make it right, doesn't excuse the behavior, but it helps us to understand the behavior, to understand the actor, that he or she grew up in a culture where the thought of questioning even disobeying his own landscape, but even the thought of questioning authority is beyond the pale of how this culture works. I think secondly <coughs> is the psychological construction of the other. How is it, and to me this is one of the important, maybe the most important piece of the model, how is it that we come to define the other in such a way 
that it's okay to kill them. And not even okay, but it's actually, it goes beyond that. One of the first testimonies I read about a perpetrator on trial in Germany after the war, and you read these testimonies from trial transcripts, and they're very, they're very rough. I mean, obviously the perpetrator is trying to make himself or herself appear in the best light possible, but sometimes you'll have something very transparent come through. And this one line of questioning, the perpetrator is being asked by the prosecutor, how did you come to think it was right to kill Jews? And the perpetrator's response was, it wasn't that I thought it was right to kill them, I thought it was wrong if I didn't kill them. Notice the difference there. It's not just okay to kill them, but it's actually wrong if I don't kill them. This is the disengagement and the separation that a perpetrator can have from a victim to such a degree that it's not only kill them, it's actually wrong if you don't kill them. And we see this type of moral disengagement uh, often throughout the Holocaust and other cases of genocide. You see the victims labeled uh, with pejorative terms as swine, as rats, as pestilence. And Rwanda was in Uzi as cockroaches. I mean, this is very common in cases of, of even military uh, campaigns, but certainly common in genocidal violence. The separation of the victim from the universe, the uh, moral universe of the perpetrator, in such a way that their victimization is actually deserved, almost. Again, this kind of struck me early on when I was uh, researching for the first edition of the book that came out in 2002. I was trying to, to get in the mindset of perpetrators to understand how they overcame this moral problem of killing innocent people. And I still remember the library I was sitting in in Germany doing research where it struck me that I was asking the wrong question. Because for perpetrators, there was no moral problem to get over. And as you talk with perpetrators, as you read transcripts of perpetrator testimony, you see this again and again and again. They kind of scratch their heads because there's just no moral problem in their view. <coughs> the victim is so far outside their universe of moral commitment, it's just, it's just not part of it. For them, literally, it's no more of a moral problem for them to kill another human as it is for most of you to lift up your foot and stomp a bug. Our comfort, I mean, you don't have any moral issue with that. Because most of you feel that animal falls outside the bounds of your moral commitment. Perpetrators come to view their victims. But they can come to that view through education. They can come to that view through religious teaching. They can come to that view through social and legal admonitions that make that view okay and acceptable. But how do they get there? I think this is an important piece. And it also helps us understand the extreme cruelty of perpetrators. And again, we're not going to go over this in detail. We've read enough. We know that sometimes perpetrators are incredibly creative in the brutality of what they do. How can they get that creative at the, the exercise of killing? Part of it is the fact that, again, the victim is, is just an object. It's no longer a person. It's not part of the moral universe. I mean, one of the episodes I opened with the Nitz make last chapter, you know, some of the American cavalry troops in the removal and the genocide against American <coughs> Indians and westward expansion. I mean, you have accounts of cavalry members taking the testicles of American Indian males that they've slaughtered, emptying the testicles out, sewing the tops, and making tobacco pouches and sending those home to family as gifts. You have testimonies of cavalry members excising or cutting out the vagina of female victims and then turning it over and stuffing it on their saddle horn as a trophy. How do we get to that point that a victim is no longer, it's not, not just acceptable to kill them, but you can degrade and denigrate and debase them in such a way that they simply become an object they simply become a trophy. I think that understanding, as hard as it is for us to get into that, that understanding is key to understanding perpetrator mindset. <clears throat> and finally, the social construction of cruelty. And here what I'm trying to get at is, you know, genocide never happens because one person just goes out and starts to kill other people. It happens as a group dynamic. So what is it about the group that's important in making genocidal perpetrators? Uh, this is male camaraderie. 
it's ritual, it's peer pressure. And again, I think to me what's fascinating in studying perpetrators, and hopefully, hopefully you get some sense of this as you read the book, is that the things we talk about that make perpetrators are all things you experience, but just to a lesser degree. You experience peer pressure, right? You've been in places where you've done things you might not normally do because someone has kind of pushed you to do it or laughed at you because you weren't really going to do it or didn't do it. Perpetrators, are, the, the motivations in the group are no different than what you've experienced. They're just more extreme. They're just more heightened. So very seldom, for instance, in perpetrator literature and interviews, very seldom, have I run across someone for whom the first kill was easy? They killed in the genocide, they loved doing it, they couldn't wait to do it, it was easy and they were good at it. We just don't see that that often. Most often what you see is someone who kills, good people are egging them on to kill, they have to do it as a ritualization, they have to do it as an entree into the group. And you've read about this with gangs in America, right? And once they do the first one, they may vomit, they may have hallucinations. They may have nightmares. They may have to be drunk out of their skull to do the killing. But over time, it becomes routinized. Over time, it becomes typical. Over time, it becomes somewhat ordinary. And again, I can give you another example. I have a friend, uh, Ben Gagande, who works at the U.S. Institute of Peace. And Ben is from Uganda. And when she's not at the U.S. Institute of Peace in D.C., she's back in Uganda taking former child soldiers from the Lord's Resistance Army in Uganda, you may have heard about, and she is trying to educate those child soldiers. And she tells a story of two boys she's working with in a classroom, and they get in a fight over a ruler. Okay? One boy found, and these are both 12-year-olds, roughly. Africa doesn't typically have birth certificates, certainly not in Uganda, but she's guessing roughly 12. One boy grabs a ruler, jumps up on the chair with the ruler in hand, looks at the other boy and says, I've killed 45 people. One more doesn't matter. He's 12 years old, okay? But you see there the routinization of killing. I've killed 45 people. One more doesn't matter. And that's the same type of progression we see in perpetrator behavior. I'm sure the first one for that boy was difficult. He probably did it high on drugs, probably did it drunk, he probably did it with someone actually trying to help him pull the trigger. But I'm also sure that the 45th one came easily. And the 45th one may have even come with some degree of satisfaction. Because he was getting good at what was valued in his subculture. And this is really what this third piece is about. What's the subculture that a perpetrator finds himself or herself <coughs> enmeshed in? And then finally, uh, and we'll take some questions. Um, this is an important discussion. Because the age of genocide is not over. We've hit on this a little bit before. I think with the continuation of population growth and the scarcity of resources, um, those are things that lead to conflict. <coughs> right now, seven out of ten conflicts in Africa, the most conflict ridden continent in the world, seven out of ten conflicts are over scarcity of what? Resources. resources and specifically what resources? Water. Just water. And the world doesn't have the energy or the time to try and get water to these very densely populated parts of Africa. And people are fighting over the scarcity of this resource. So the more conflicts we have, the more chance that some of those will kind of flame up and become genocidal. So unfortunately, if you're interested in this field, it's, it's a field that has a, a future in that way. Is there a difference between explaining behavior and excusing it? I certainly hope you uh, understand this, and if you read the book, and you highlight any parts of it, these are the parts I want you to highlight that, you know, there's nothing in this work or, or the work of anyone who studies perpetrators, for we are trying to excuse the behavior of the perpetrator or apologize for it. All that people in this field are doing is trying to understand the behavior so we can stop it, so we can prevent it from happening. Excusing and understanding are two different propositions. And I think you could make a couple mistakes here. One could be, would be to say, um, I'm just not going to study this whatsoever. Another would be to say, all I'm going to do is condemn it, but not understand it. Another would be to say, all I'm going to do is understand it, not condemn it. I think you can do both of those. We can understand how this happens. And in the same breath, we can still say, 
These people bear full moral, legal responsibility for what they do, and they are not excused one iota. The Oscar Guard was put to death. I haven't lost a wink of sleep worried about the fact that he was put to death and wishing that he hadn't been, that he was given more grace and leniency. I simply try to understand how did he go from this person to this person? That doesn't make him any less responsible for what he did. I just want to understand how that process unfolded, again, with the hopes of preventing it. And then finally, yeah, you know the book. You got the book. You see it there. So it's the second edition published in 2007. Uh, I'm going to take about the next 10 minutes and make sure you get out of here before the next monsoon and uh, answer any questions or address any comments you might have about the book, the presentation, anything. Yes? Speak up. Uh, Martin, speak up. In the fourth chapter, you speak about um, uh, Lifton's uh, theory in Dublin. Uh -huh. Uh, and I just kind of wanted to get your uh, ideas on that. I know you, you explain it for what you understand and how it is that the perpetrators could use doubling not as a, or, or people could use doubling not as a, 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 an explanation as to how they came about committing the, uh, the killing, but how it can be uh, an explanation as to how they coped yeah. with, the, with the killing afterwards. Um, is there other tools, or is it something that becomes nature, kind of innate in these people after committing these genocides, uh, to 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 learn to live with it somehow, or separate themselves from uh, from what they have committed? That's a great question. The question is basically about now how do perpetrators learn to cope with what they've done? And in chapter four, as you mentioned. I kind of take issue with Robert Lipton, a psychoanalyst, who says that perpetrators double. They create a second self to do their evil, and that's how they do it. I think that's too sophisticated. I think they may have a second self that helps them cope with what they do. So for instance, the thought that you come in as an Auschwitz doctor, and you would hang your hat and coat at the door, and with that, you would kind of leave some self behind, and you would do your evil work, leave, get your hat and coat, go home to a wife and children, and be a strong family man, you know, that, that certainly is possible, but I don't think it's, it's the cause of the behavior. I think it's one of the ways perpetrators cope, is they may create kind of a second life. But I think the, the more common thing I've seen, particularly in Rwanda and Bosnia and Herzegovina, is you cope with what you do because you surround yourself with people who've done the same thing. In other words, you, you embed yourself in a culture in which what you did is defined as right, as heroic, as creative, as the good thing to do. So you really don't have to cope with it because in your culture, and again, it's upside down, in your culture, you're doing exactly what the culture is going to reward. Now, if you're a perpetrator and you're having to go home every night to a culture that's very different from that, I don't think that's a dissonance you can live with for a long period of time. And we see this in Rwanda. We see young boys and young men leaving their families during the genocide because they just can't go home at night and bear to see their mother. So they go home at night with the other members of the entire Hanway where, again, what they do is the right thing. And so it's not, I, I don't think it's much as developing a coping mechanism as much as you avoid putting yourself in situations that you have to develop a coping mechanism. You just, you define your world and what you're doing as normal, as moral, and as acceptable. And I think you do that by embedding yourself in that culture more than anything else. Yeah. And certainly there will be other, I mean, coping mechanisms of alcohol, drug abuse, and things like that, those are common as well. But again, I don't think those are the long-term coping mechanisms that, that usually, to me, explain appropriate behavior. Other questions? Yes. How would you explain Hitler by natural selection? How would I explain Hitler by natural selection? <laughs> I mean, you do talk about natural selection a lot. <laughs> yeah. No, I think, uh, and I go back on the slide, I don't think I can do that. Uh, I think evolution has a lot to tell us about the broad mechanics of human behavior and why we have evolved to the point that peer pressure matters, for instance. 
Um, I don't think evolution deals with individual cases. So I would never, I guess my response to your question, I really don't mean to dodge it, is I know really little about Hitler. He has just not been my focus. A lot of other people have focused on him. My interest has been his policies and how they were implemented by other people. And I'd also say then from an evolutionary sense, I don't think evolution is used appropriately when we use it to, to explain individual behavior. I think it's used appropriately when we use it to understand the broader influence of behavior. Does that make sense? Yes, except that as an individual, we have such a strong impact that it's difficult not to try to put it into some theory. Yeah, exactly. It's one of the theories of your book. Exactly. And, and again, I don't, you know, I, I never wanted to say we shouldn't study the architects of genocide, because we have to understand who they are and where they came from and so on. But it's just the thing I've been off to focus on has been that rank and file. Yes? Um, when, you're, when you go to Auschwitz, um, you're, I'm assuming you're doing it to educate. Right. Um, what tools are you offering people to cope with, well, to prevent genocide in there? Yeah, thanks. That's a good question. The Auschwitz seminars, again, are for government officials, mid level junior government officials. 20 of them come at a time. I think the tools we offer are kind of two, twofold. Mm -hmm. One is, to define what genocide is and what the warning signs are. Because what happens is, if you don't know what genocide is ahead of time, what the warning signs are, by the time it's happened and you notice it, it's almost already done in a lot of cases. So we want them to know. We want to have someone sitting at the government desk in Argentina who has learned what genocide is and what the warning signs are so he or she can point it out in a meeting of some type. The other toolbox that we give them then is once you've identified something as genocidal, what are the things you do to bring it to the attention of your government? Who do you contact at the UN? Uh, what commissioner do you contact at the UN? What council do you contact? What international human rights groups do you contact? And, I mean, it's just very practical, logistical. When you see genocide occurring and you feel that your government's not responsive, here's the international contacts you have and can go to. And again, you know, these people at Auschwitz are mid-level junior government officials. Uh, I don't know how often they're going to speak up. I don't know what influence they can have. But I also know 20 years from now, there'll be a couple of these people that have risen to pretty high positions of power in their government. Uh, we had one of the first members um, of our group last May is a female minister of family affairs in the Democratic Republic of Congo. She's already in a position that she can make a difference. And she's actually going to be running for president in the next election for the DRC. So, you know, the thought is that if we get to enough junior level government officials, some of these men and women are going to be at the highest level of their government and can start to make a difference. Because, if, again, the sense is we want to develop a political will that forces the UN to stop genocide. And we haven't done that yet because people don't really know what genocide is and they don't know how to respond to it when they see it. And I think this is just a beginning attempt to try and make a difference in that way. And this class has been, I mean, you guys, I'm sure Dr. Goodman would say this, if you leave this class and program and you have you don't have the political will to say something about Darfur to your elected representatives and to educate people around you about Darfur, then all of this has been for naught in a lot of ways. It hasn't made the difference that we hope it makes. There's a question in the back. No, that's great. There have been a lot of studies about the children of perpetrators in Nazi Germany. We haven't had the same types of studies about children of perpetrators in Rwanda and Bosnia and Herzegovina, but what we have are studies about the effects of genocide on children. Um, I think I say, and now I'm afraid I'm going to misquote my own self, but in the small chapter of Rwanda, I think I said 97% of children in Rwanda have seen someone murdered. Is that true? You didn't, you didn't say that. Okay, good. I did say some, <laughs> some high number, and I think the high number is 97%. This is a great question. What's the future of the country when 97% of its children have seen murder? At first hand, not on TV, 
have firsthand seen someone killed. I mean, don't we have to be concerned about the future of that country and the effects on it? In Rwanda today, 70% <coughs> of the population is female. This is a great this is a great adjustment for Rwanda. So many men were lost in the genocide that Rwanda today is having to reinvent the role of females in their society. Because before 1994, if you were a female in Rwanda, you had no government aspirations, you had no leadership aspirations, it wasn't part of the culture. Today, it has to be part of the culture because so many of the people in Rwanda are female. And they're having to learn what it means to be leaders, what it means to be government figures, and Rwanda is having to invent kind of a new culture. So, you know, all of this is to say, and the effects of genocide are never limited to the genocide. The effects are generational. You have people in this room who survived the Holocaust, and whose parents survived the Holocaust, or lost family members of the Holocaust. And you can talk to them, you can talk to the panelists who come here about the effects on their lives of something that happened 50, 60 years ago, 10, 20 years ago. So I mean, these are the things that we're continuing to obviously study the impact on, but I think you get some sense of uh, the severe repercussions of genocide in society. Yes? Yeah, that's a great question. How, what do we think of as bystanders? You know, this is a book, I remember when I was writing this back in 2000, and the way I write is I kind of lay out a day and I think, okay, on this day I can get through this material, this, or this part of the chapter. And I had to say, I had to decide like four hours to do the definition of evil, and I thought, oh, this would be easy. I'll have like two hours free, I can go play basketball, walk around campus or something. It took me like four weeks to get through the stupid definition. I didn't realize so many people were divided over what evil was and how to define it. And I'm still, if you ask me today, when I'm most dissatisfied with my own work, it's how I define evil. So all that to say, it's hard to answer your question because the definition of evil is, is so slippery. But the important part of your question is the role of bystanders. Because in truth, in a, in a genocidal society, very few people will be perpetrators, very few people will be rescuers, the great bulk of people are bystanders. So what do you consider them? Are they victims, some people would argue? Or are they perpetrators, some people would argue? Because, they're, because you know, it's been attributed to a ton of different people, but the famous quote is, all that has to happen for evil to flourish is for good men and women to set by and allow it to happen. So bystanders take a huge part of responsibility in this. If you have it written, a state senator, a congressional representative, a local newspaper, a campus newspaper about our poor, you're a bystander. You've gone on over six years and you haven't done anything about it. You're a bystander. Are you a perpetrator of that genocide? I mean, do you bear some responsibility for the fact that we have to stop that killing? Are you also in some ways a victim? Are you just this separate category of bystander, you're neither perpetrator or victim? Those lines are very gray. And I'm certainly not going to be someone who classifies bystanders as perpetrators. But there's a facility of bystanders that allows evil to happen. And I think that's, you know, if you ask about the future of genocide prevention, to me, that's the big piece. How do you take a bystander and make him or her what some people are calling an upstander? I mean, this course, this program, in part, is about you moving from bystander to upstander. Because you can no longer plead ignorance. You have the information now, and with the information comes responsibility for you to stand up some way, somehow. And this, I think, is going to be a key issue in genocide prevention. Can we educate, inform, inspire people to move from bystander to upstander? If we can, we can stop killing. If we can do that, we can stop genocide. If we can't do it, we've seen what those effects are as well. One final question, and we'll let you go for dinner. Yes? Um, what don't you, if you're not satisfied with your definition of people, what, what's wrong with it? You feel like, what is really missing? Uh, I'd have to look back at this book even now and figure out.
up with the deck. Now you got it there. <laughs> How, what did I say? He said, I define human evil as the deliberate harming of humans by other humans. Yeah. Well, I think what's terrible about it, now that you read it, I mean, more embarrassing, <laughs> um, <laughs> is, I mean, deliberate raises issues of intent, intent to harm the judge. Harming is a very ambiguous term. And I, I, I remember, I mean, I, I kept it that simple and that kind of unsatisfying because anything else seemed to be worse to me. But, I mean, how do we define harm? Is harm just in the physical destruction of the people? Can it be cultural destruction? Can it be verbal destruction? I mean, they're just a, you know, I went into it, to be honest, thinking, well, everyone sees genocide, and they know that's evil. I shouldn't have to define evil. And I was just reading today a um, book called Now on Our Watch about a, <coughs> a story of a, a Chinese philosopher, and they're debating what evil is around the well, and some uh, peasant comes by, and a philosopher stops and says, what is evil? And the peasant says, if someone comes and throws a baby down that well, that's evil. And that's, this is kind of the problem, but I mean, clearly that's evil, right? Clearly, genocide is evil. But also clearly, when you're writing a book with evil in the title, you need some operational definition. So I'm not pleased with its fuzziness and with its vagueness and with its ambiguity, but I think I'm also, would say, in my own defense, that's just part of the nature of defining evil. It, it, it's going to be that. I don't know if it can, I think whatever you add with more precision, you're going to lose in other areas. And that's why eventually I settled on something I'm not thrilled with, but I still think it was the best option. Well, I want to thank you very much for your time.